took my mother's oldest grandchild from her. And for that, I can never forgive you. I hope you, I hope you can deal with what you've done. One after another, the relatives of his victims poured out the pain and grief they had suffered at the hands of Jeffrey Dahmer. Few crimes in modern American history can compare to the dark secrets that came out of apartment 213 in this quiet Milwaukee neighborhood. Investigators found seven skulls and four heads one of them in a refrigerator. In this blue barrel, still more body parts. After 13 years, the murder spree had finally come to an end, but not before at least 17 young men were dead, their bodies mutilated. Some had even been cannibalized to satisfy the killer's twisted sexual urges. After a two-week trial in January 1992, Jeffrey Dahmer was sentenced to more than 900 years in prison. This defendant, will never again see freedom. Little consolation for the grieving families, or for this man who listened with a combination of disbelief and shame, Lionel Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer's father. To have a child murdered and mutilated is a horror from which no parent recovers. But what about the parent whose child committed the crimes? What Lionel Dahmer learned about his son in this Milwaukee courthouse two years ago led to another kind of hell where a father turns the questions of guilt and responsibility on himself, wondering, where did I go wrong? Was there something I could have said or done to have prevented this? Did I help create a serial killer? It's been eternal torment. 57-year-old Lionel Dahmer, a In research the, chemist, uh, has confronted some of the most painful questions any parent could ever ask. Room, um, In a haunting book called A Father's Story, he looks for the origins of his son's madness, and one of the first places he looks is in the mirror. As I began to confront Jeff's childhood imaginings, it became clear to me that they had not always been wholly different from my own. These same needs and impulses had lived a shadowy half-life in me. When you were a teenager, you had dreams of committing murder yourself. Almost always after I was either physically or in some other way harassed by bullies, I would wake up, say, the next morning, and I would, I would have this feeling that I had hurt someone, that I had maybe hurt them badly, that I had killed them. Uh, Lionel Dahmer also the reveals that as a teenager struggling with feelings of inferiority, he had his own destructive obsessions with fire and homemade bombs. And this was your way of what? Achieving some control? Gaining some respect? I felt like I was in control and I had some power. I was noticed. You seem to believe that you may have passed on some kind of genetic propensity for obsession or destructive behavior. It's something to be considered. I mean, I want to consider everything. A series of childhood infections a hernia operation that seemed to traumatize Jeffrey when he was four. At about that same time, something else happened. Lionel had removed some dead animals from the crawl space beneath their house and placed the bones in a bucket. I noticed that Jeff had picked up these bones and just let them drop back down into the, into the bucket and made a, a clanging noise. And he seemed uh, sort of entranced by that. He just said, as he dropped them down, it's just like fiddlesticks, he says. They just have such Looking back on it now, Lionel says he can't help wondering if there was more to it than just child's play. I can no longer distinguish the ordinary from the forbidding, trivial events from ones loaded with foreboding. When he was four and pointed to his belly button and asked what would happen if someone cut it out, was that merely an ordinary question from a child who had begun to explore his own body? Or was it a sign of something morbid already growing in his mind? When we went fishing, and he seemed captivated by the gutted fish, staring intently at the brightly colored entrails, was that a child's natural curiosity, or was it a harbinger of the horror that was later to be found in apartment 213? What was he like as a, as a, young, as a young boy? 
wonderful. <laughs> I thought he was wonderful. Jeffrey's um, mother, Joyce. He was fun. He, we did all the normal things that people do. If I'd seen something that had been a, a clue of any kind, I, I'd, I'd like to think that I would have done something about it immediately. No, there, w there wasn't anything unusual about Jeff. But according to Lionel, by the time Jeffrey entered this elementary school in Doylestown, Ohio, he was no longer the buoyant child his parents once knew. Jeff's first grade teacher described him as inordinately shy, so that he stayed away from all the kids out here on the playground and seemed to be profoundly unhappy. Shouldn't that have set off some kind of alarm? We visited the, uh, the teacher and uh, we became very concerned, as she did. Uh, but I thought it was just shyness, as I had gone through when I was a youngster in school. But what for you had been shyness, for him, was becoming near total isolation. That's right. In retrospect, that's very true. As Jeffrey entered adolescence, he became even more withdrawn. Lionel and Joyce were fighting, at times so violently, he says knives were drawn. Their strained marriage was beginning to crack. There were times when he heard the shouting and he went outside and just left the house. I learned later that he was slapping the trees with uh, branches and sticks and uh, I guess uh, apparently out of frustration. When you think back on those times, the arguments and the possible effect, it makes it cause you anguish? It makes me sick. It really makes me sick that we didn't have a more Ozzy and Harriet type family. And I'll feel that way to my death. In his endless second guessing about the upbringing of his child, there is one last agonizing possibility that haunts Lionel Dahmer. That the drugs he says were prescribed for his wife when she was pregnant with Jeffrey might have harmed him. Lionel remembers a very difficult pregnancy. Her, her jaw would go sideways and lock and her eyes would bulge. And I know it so sort of sounds like epilepsy. It does sound like a seizure of, a fit, of some a seizure, kind. Right. But it was not diagnosed as that. The, the doctor did not say that that's what it was. He did not know what it was. A doctor would usually have to intervene, giving Joyce injections of barbiturates and morphine, which would finally relax her. While current medical literature says barbiturates taken during pregnancy can cause fetal damage, at Jeffrey's trial, experts said it was impossible to link his criminal behavior to the prescription drugs his mother may have taken during her pregnancy. And tests showed no brain or genetic abnormalities. When we asked Joyce about her pregnancy, she disputed much of what Lionel said had happened and told us she doesn't know why he continues to raise questions about it, unless it's to blame her. There were no seizures. I can't imagine where that comes from. It isn't true. I don't... <laughs> um, you don't recall any, anything like that? No, seizures I, or no, seizure-like episodes? Absolutely not. Is it um, possible you just don't remember them? Joyce? No, it's not possible I don't remember them. It was my first pregnancy. I remember everything about my first pregnancy. Were you prescribed medications, including morphine? Barbiturates? Oh, I don't know what medications were prescribed, and I had a doctor, a physician. I took the medicine that was prescribed for me, and for the most part, I was healthy. There was nothing um, that was out of the ordinary as far as my pregnancy was concerned. Except that In the end, she, like Lionel, has no answers, only questions. Jeff was raised with all the love and care and concern uh, that any child could be raised with. And what happened to him? I don't know. I wish I knew. I'd give anything to know. I asked the universe, why would this be allowed to happen? I don't have an answer for that. You don't have any answers, do you? No. No, I don't. What do you see when you look at Jeff's face? Um, I guess uh, the parent, naive parent in me still says, I see a, uh, an innocent, uh, shy child, 
a defenseless, vulnerable child who I wish I could help now. Every month, Lionel Dahmer, along with his second wife, Sherry, makes the 11-hour drive from their home in Ohio to the Wisconsin prison, where his son will spend the rest of his life. Except for the guard towers, you wouldn't really see right away that it is a prison. Though father and son have spent many hours together during these regular visits at the prison, incredibly, they've never talked about the horrific crimes that have made the name Dahmer so infamous. They've never talked about Jeffrey's childhood or the many questions Lionel has had about why Jeffrey did what he did until now. Hi, Jeff. Sherry, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. The two of you never really communicated all that much, did you, father and son? Not on, an, not on any deep, deep level, no. We talked about superficial things. Uh, never really had a, a real deep heart-to-heart -heart talk about what was going on inside our own minds. Why do you think that was? Uh, because from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. As a teenager, there were many things Jeffrey felt he couldn't share with his parents. But in Lionel Dahmer's home, one subject was particularly taboo. Did you ever consider talking to your parents, to your dad, about homosexuality? Is that something no, that you felt you could ever raise? Early on, I, I really didn't know that much about it myself. Uh, all I knew was that it was something that uh, was to be kept hush-hush, not uh, talked about, not even thought about. So I just uh, kept it all within me and never, never talked about sexual issues at all, really, with anybody. If Jeff had come to you and said, Dad, I'm a homosexual, how would you have reacted? I th think I would have started in on a program to, to try to change his thinking. So you would not have been accepting? No, no. Do you believe to this day that he is, as a homosexual, living in a state of sin? If you believe the inspired word of God, which I do, that is sin. It's repugnant to God. Do you think Jeff was ashamed of his homosexuality? I think so. He certainly hid so. it from you. Mm -hmm. He sure did. Do you think if you had been able to talk about that in a more open way, that it would have helped talking about it, I don't think would have made that much difference. Because like I said, there were things going on in my head that uh, I would have never opened up and talked about with anybody. Jeffrey's secret homosexuality was only one force that drove him into his own world. His parents' incessant fighting was another. It was unnerving, depressing, uh, made me angry sometimes. Uh, I'd leave the house, go out in the woods and uh, sulk brooding, you know, wondering why they had to uh, have such a rough relationship. Your dad says that somewhere around the age of six, he thought that you began to change, that you began to withdraw, that you became much more shy. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the time I really, really remember uh, noticing that things weren't quite right. So it wasn't so much innate shyness as it was wanting to withdraw from tension and arguments problems in the house. That's how I saw it, yeah. Just, uh, uh, I, I uh, sort of uh, lived in my own little fantasy world when things got too heated in the household. It was just, uh, just my own little world where I had control. That fantasy world may have been Jeffrey's retreat from violence as a boy, but as he grew up, it would become a world filled with violence. Maybe I felt uh, I had no control as a, as a child or young adult, and uh, that got mixed in with my sexuality, and I ended up doing what I did was my way of, of feeling in, in complete control, at least for that situation. 
creating my own little world where I had the final say, where I could completely control a person, a person that I found physically attractive, and uh, keep them with me as long as possible, even if it meant just keeping a part of them. One of your dad's biggest questions is when you began to slip away, when you crossed over into this world of obsession or dark fantasy from which you just couldn't return. I think it was around <clears throat> age 14 or 15, started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence uh, intermingled with sex. And it just got worse and worse. Uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it, so I didn't. I just kept it all inside. Tell me about this house right here. One of the things Jeffrey kept inside early on was a bizarre teenage fascination with dead animals. This from a boy who 10 years earlier had played fiddlesticks with a bucket of animal bones. Lionel took us back to the neighborhood in Ohio where his son's strange rituals began. He uh, rode around on his bike, and took uh, containers, garbage uh, bags and so forth and collected road kills and brought them back and examined them. It was something Lionel says he never knew about until the trial. One of the biggest things that I've been wondering is just how on earth, how it got established with entrails, you know, with the right. insides of dogs or foxes as you um, made your way around the neighborhood. On, I think it on started, started maybe started out as just uh, childhood curiosity. Just to see what it looked like inside? Right, or? right. And uh, something, something went wrong. Was was there some pleasure in in the cutting open of the animal? Yes, there was. No, no sexual pleasure, but just a. Um, it's hard to describe. Sense of power, sense of control. I suppose that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. It's impossible to know why Jeffrey's obsessions progressed from roadkill to humans. But it didn't take long. During our visit back to the old neighborhood, Lionel showed us where the stalking began. When Jeff was 14, he rode his bike over here from his home a couple miles away. At this location, hid in the, in the trees and the bushes with a sawed-off baseball bat waiting for a jogger to come by. And what was he going to do? Well, he was going to hit the jogger over the head with the baseball bat, make him unconscious, and lie with him, lie with a motionless body. Do you remember at age 14, hiding in the bushes alongside that road, thinking about attacking yes. a jogger? Yes, yeah, I remember doing that. So that's the point at which it shifted from, from animals to people. Uh, years 14 or 15 in that area, yeah. He never attacked any joggers. But it was on these same roads at age 18 that Jeffrey, now struggling with alcoholism, picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks and brought him home. The house was empty. Jeffrey's parents had recently divorced, and he was home alone. Uh, I wish I just keep on, kept on going, but I didn't. I turned around, picked him up, and uh, that's when, that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. What happened after you took him to the house? Uh, we talked, had some drinks. Uh, I knocked him out, and that was, that was the first time. In August 1978, about a month after the Hicks murder, Lionel and Sherry Jordan, his girlfriend at the time, went to check on Jeffrey. What was the scene like when you came into the house and saw him? He had a dead look in his eye, and he just looked extremely sad. He was wandering aimlessly about the house. He was very uncomfortable. Uh, his mother had moved out. Um, he, he was at, torn between the two parents. He was a lost child. Was this about some kind of desire to keep these people with you, not to be abandoned, not to have them leave? I think it, 
that did play into it. But uh, there was a big element of wanting complete control over someone, total control, uh, not having to, to consider their wishes, being able to keep them there as long as I wanted. And uh, that, that was a big part of it. Lust played a big part of it, controlling lust. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like uh, it had control of my life from there on end. I, it it uh, was a major part of my thinking from then on. Did you want to try to stop? Yes, I, I tried. I tried to stop. And the killing did stop for a while. But Jeffrey says in 1984, while living here at his grandmother's house in Milwaukee, his violent compulsions consumed him once again. One night, cruising these bars in downtown Milwaukee, he met a young man and took him to this hotel. I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him conscious. And I uh, was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised, and his chest was, was bruised, and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed. And uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it, when it all started again. And once it started again, you found it impossible to stop. Right, that, that's when the, the obsession went into full swing. My, my only objective was to find the, the best looking uh, guy that I could. I went to bathhouses, I went to bars, uh, shopping malls. Uh, their sexual preference didn't matter to me. Uh, Did their race matter to you? No, their race didn't matter to me. The first, the first two young men were white. The, set, the third young man was American Indian. The fourth and fifth were Hispanic. So no, race had nothing to do with it. It was just their looks. Was it the killing that excited you, or is it what happened after the killing? No. One of those failed experiments to create a living zombie was conducted on this 14-year-old boy. Jeffrey had drilled a hole in his head and poured in acid, a crude attempt at lobotomy that none of his victims survived. Was there something sexual in the dismemberment of the bodies for you? How did Jeffrey Dahmer get away with his murderous acts for as long as he did? As we found out talking to both him and his father, Jeffrey was not only a highly efficient predator, he was also a consummate liar. I had to do a lot of lying, a lot of covering up, a lot of uh, pretending. Were there times when your dad may have been closer to discovering what was going on than even he knew? The box incident was about the uh, as close as it came, yeah. The so-called box incident happened in 1989, 
when Jeffrey had already killed at least five young men. It was a, about a one-foot square box, uh, metal and wood box. My dad uh, one week came to visit and happened to see it and uh, he was wondering what was in it. He didn't know. Nobody knew. And I said, Jeff, open it up. I just want to see what's in there. We got into uh, a bit of an argument because I wouldn't open it up. And I said, Jeff, open it up or, or I'm going to just take it down into the basement and get a screwdriver or something and open it up. I was thinking I've got to stop this from happening. He got angry, very visibly agitated. I thought, you know, it's all going to come crashing down now. Not uh, fathoming what could be in that box, I said, okay, I'll just open it up tomorrow then, and then let's get rid of it, whatever it is. What was in the box? The mummified head and, and uh, genitals of uh, a young man I met in one of the bars down in Milwaukee. But the box was never opened, uh, not in my dad's presence. And so the, uh, the lies continued. And so did the murders. I didn't uh, have to be accountable to anybody. I felt that I could keep it in my own secret little world, keep everything under control, um, and would never have to deal with the consequences. And so things just progressed from bad to worse. Your dad has wondered about all kinds of things, from the medication that your mom was on during her pregnancy, to the fact that you were exposed to violent arguments in the home from an early age and continuing, to the possibility that he might have passed on some genetic propensity for obsession or violent behavior. Does any of that ring true to you? I, I can see why he'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses. I feel it's uh, wrong for people who commit crimes to try to shift the blame onto somebody else, onto their parents or onto their, their upbringing or, circ or living circumstances. I, I think that's just a, a cop-out. I take full responsibility. How do you feel about what you did? I'm glad that it's over. Um, there, there's nothing, any words I say to the, to the victim's families are, are just going to seem trite and empty. Uh, I, I don't know how to express the regret, the sorrow. Um, that I feel for what I've done for their for their sons. Uh, I can't find the right words. Is it still there, Jeff? Does it ever go away? In part, no, it never it never completely goes away. I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Uh, it's not nearly so bad now that there, there's no avenues to, to actually act on it. But uh, no, it never seems to go completely away. So the thoughts still come to you? Sometimes, yeah. When our interview at the prison ended, Jeffrey said goodbye to his father, but on his way back to his cell, something caught his eye. Just a point of interest that that's the type of box. This is the, this is the type of box. Exactly. Yeah. A little bigger. That's exactly what it looked like. Right. 